Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to do another live stream Fish Bite podcast, and today I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Greater Pulser, and today we're going to be discussing Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of John. So welcome hey, back Jacob. to the podcast. Yeah. How are you doing? Pretty good. Just uh, getting ready to start another semester. This is like classes start next week, so we got this nice little moment um, mm-hmm. where it's easier to have a podcast. Um, thanks for having me back. Yeah, thank you for joining me. So I want to start us off with this. What do we know about the historical Mary Magdalene? That's a great question. And it's a hard question to answer um, because specialists' answers have actually changed. I mean, I've actually seen some people maybe 30 years ago were asked this question. And um, one of the first things that they said was, oh, we know that... um, she was a prominent follower of Jesus. I would still agree with that. And that she was from the town called Magdala. And that's all we can know about her. And I'm like, no, she's not from Magdala. <laughs> we can't actually know that at all. Um, because her name just basically means Tower S. That's what it means. Migdal or Magdala. Migdal Hebrew, Magdala Aramaic means tower. Ene means it's like a Greek ending indicating a feminine person. So scholars maybe 30 years ago would say, oh, she's from the town called Tower. But um, I've written an article with Joan Taylor, a journal of biblical literature that's basically saying, oh, that could just as well be her um, title, sort of like Peter the Rock Mary could be a tower. Um, Not that that can be proven, but um, I have sort of, argued that she could just as well be Mary of Bethany, Lazarus's sister in the Gospel of John. And that character only, if that's the case, that character would only appear in John's Gospel um, if Martha were a later edition, which is what you and I talked about in the last podcast. Then Lazarus and Mary would be a totally different family in John's Gospel than Martha and Mary in Luke's Gospel. And so, um, You know, the thing is that we can't actually know. First of all, we can't know for certain that Martha was added to the text. There's that um, because it's just a theory. And even if, um, you know, let's say that somehow we found a copy of the Gospel of John where Martha was totally absent, you still wouldn't be able to prove that Mary of Bethany is Mary Magdalene. You can just make argument that she is. So, um, I mean, I'm say, I want to say that it's possible that she's the sister of Lazarus and that she comes from the town of Bethany. And um, in that case, she is probably, I mean, you could say that she may have been wealthy because it does say in Luke's gospel that she funded Jesus's ministry along with a couple of other fancy ladies, um, Joanna and Susanna. And Joanna would have been the wife of uh, Husa, who was someone in Herod's court. So that's someone who's sort of like a high up woman. Um, and so it's it's sort of like, OK, maybe she had money. And if she was Mary of Bethany, then maybe she had the means to purchase an expensive jar of spikenard with which to anoint Jesus. So um, she would have maybe been an independent woman because she's not identified by her husband or sons or father. She's just Mary the Magdalene. So it's possible that she's a wealthy woman who is independent. And um, some people would say they think that she's from Magdala. And some people like me would say, or maybe she's from Bethany. And we know she was probably there at the crucifixion, all four gospels, well, kind of Luke's gospel. Luke sort of says it after the fact, but The Gospels say that she was there present to witness Jesus's crucifixion. And then um, the Gospels, especially Matthew and John, say that she was a first witness of Jesus's resurrection. But of course, you know, whether the resurrection even happened is a debatable debatable historical fact. So you couldn't say like the historical Mary Magdalene witnessed the risen Jesus because the resurrection itself is debatable. Um, But whether she went to the empty tomb Um, on Easter morning, that seems fairly likely since Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in various ways do say that. Um, So that's basically what we can know. It's not a whole lot. Um, But, you know, we can say she was a pretty prominent, important follower of Jesus. She's almost always the first woman listed 
enlists of women of Jesus's disciples, uh, women followers. Um, and so she was probably one of the more important uh, female followers of Jesus. That's that's about all that we can know. If she is not from Magdal or Magdala, then where do you think she is from? You still know Jacob? What? Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah. If she is not from Magdal or Magdala, then where do you think she is from? My, it looks like my Wi Fi is a little bit unstable. Hmm. It doesn't usually do that. There's been a lot of power outages in hmm. Philadelphia because of the storms. So that could be, but it seems like it's okay for now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. If she is not from Magdala, where do you think she is from? Well, I've argued that she might be from Bethany. Yeah, did that come through? I don't know if I was choppy when I was saying all that stuff. <laughs> no, no, I think it did. I was just uh, ask, asking that for a clarification. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not um, saying that historically she was from Bethany. I'm saying that it can't be ruled out because the word Magdalene could mean that she's from a place called Tower. Like, but there was lots of places called Tower and it could be, you know, Tower of the Fishes or Tower of God or, you know, there's all these different, there's Migdal Gad, Migdal El, Migdal Nunaya. There's all these different towns called Tower in ancient Palestine. And so if, you know, if somebody was just calling her Tower S, it's kind of vague. You know, it doesn't really help to say that she's from a town called Tower. The one that today by the Sea of Galilee everybody would associate with Mary Magdalene. Um, nobody even said that she came from that place until the 6th century. And in the 4th century, Eusebius of Caesarea, he doesn't she say that she came from that town. And he does know a place called Magdala, but he thinks it's in the south. He thinks it's in Judea. Magdal Gad is the, what he thinks Magdala is. So it's totally vague and unknown um, where such a Magdala would be. Some people have tried to say, oh, the one by the Sea of Galilee was the one that everybody knew. But that's easily discredited by looking at what Eusebius had to say in the fourth century. Um, so, you know, it's it just means tower, tower S. That's basically what her name means. And so does it mean she's from a town called Tower? Or does it mean that she got a title, Mary the Tower S? And that cannot be historically known. So I'm just saying, because of the similarities between Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene in John's gospel, and because there seems to be some strange editorial activity happening in John chapter 11, it is possible that she was believed to be Mary of Bethany. And that's why there was editorial activity taking place in that part of John's gospel. That is a reasonable possibility. But again, even if people believed her to be Mary of Bethany, that doesn't make her the historical Mary of Bethany. John's gospel doesn't explicitly say ever that she is, that Lazarus's sister is Mary Magdalene. It's just maybe kind of implied. So it's it's tricky. It's one of these things that just can't be known. John, do you think of your question, did Mary Magdalene feature prominently in any apocryphal literature? Seems like an obvious candidate, but I don't think I've ever heard anything. Oh, gosh. Really? What about the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> I mean, that's, that whole book is based on, I mean, not fact. It is fiction. But it was inspired by the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip, which are apocryphal literature where it says that Jesus especially loves Mary. And the Gospel of Philip says that she is the companion and the consort of Christ. So um, that's just one gospel, one page, in fact, because it only survives in one copy. So the Gospel of Philip, you know, you can't say that that's history. It's one page from one codex that says she was the companion and the consort of Christ. Probably that gospel was authored in the second century. Um, and then there's the Gospel of Mary, which we have more copies of. Um, that one was also probably authored in the second century. And we have a Coptic copy from the fifth century of the Gospel of Mary, as well as two Greek fragments. And since I spoke to Jacob last, there might have been a new fragment of the Gospel of Mary that was um, published in the latest Oxyrhynchus series. We can't be certain that it's the Gospel of Mary, but it could be from sort of a missing section in the Gospel of Mary where Mary has a vision. Um, so yes, she does feature prominently, especially those two. Um, and also some people would say the Gospel of Mary 
it's just a vague Mary. It doesn't specifically say Magdalene, but it's probably her because she says she seems very similar to Mary Magdalene. She's crying. She says, I have, I saw the Lord in a vision. It sounds very much like the Mary Magdalene of John chapter 20. But again, it just says Mary in the gospel of Mary. But there's other texts like the Pista Sophia and the gospel of Philip that explicitly say Mary Magdalene. And she's sort of Jesus's closest disciple. She's like his star disciple and the others, especially Peter are jealous of her. Um, also, there's just another woman called Mary in the dialogue of the savior and the Sophia of Jesus Christ. These are just um, early Christian gospels, especially the Sophia of Jesus Christ and the dialogue of the savior. They're very old, second, third century. So there's, there's some sort of second, third century strands of gospel texts that feature a woman named Mary. She could be sort of a composite Mary, like putting together pieces of Mary of Bethany, Mary Magdalene, and even the mother of Jesus. And it's just Mary. But some of them do specifically say Mary Magdalene, especially the Pista Sophia and the Gospel of Philip. So yes, there are, she definitely features prominently, I would say, particularly in the Gospel of Philip, where she's the companion and consort of Christ, the Gospel of Mary, which is like in her name. And um, the Pista Sophia, where she's Jesus's star disciple, and she asks a million questions. Not a million, but a lot. <laughs> and what does the Gospel of John tell us about Mary Magdalene that the other, mm -hmm. that the synoptics don't? Yeah, so the Gospel of John, whether it's actually Mary Magdalene in um, John chapter 11 and 12 is debatable. I have made that argument. But as far as where she's explicitly identified as Mary the Magdalene, um, that's at the cross of Jesus. Um, and that's uh, so John agrees with Matthew and Mark that um, Mary Magdalene was there at Jesus's crucifixion. Um, and then there's also um, a scene between Jesus and Mary Magdalene uh, in John chapter 20. That's really famous where she's like by herself seeking Jesus in the garden. And it's almost certainly got some overtones with the bride seeking her beloved in the song of songs. That's kind of obvious um, for people who study like the exegetical implications. There's sort of like she's being compared. If you look in the song of songs, I think it's chapter four of the song of songs. There's this scene where the bride is at night, like seeking her beloved. And because of these overtones with the Song of Songs, like some people think that that might have been where like the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip sort of got this idea because they were written later. They might have gotten this idea inspired by the Gospel of John, where Mary Magdalene is sort of painted as the bride in the Song of Songs in John chapter 20. So she goes, she's looking for Jesus in the garden in this very sort of poetic way. She sees some angels. Well, first, first she goes and the tomb is empty and she runs back and gets Simon Peter and the beloved disciple. And she's like, hey, the tomb is empty. So um, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple run back to the empty tomb. And they look at it and they're like, whoa, what's going on here? And they're like, mm, they don't get it. And then they walk home. And then sort of suddenly it says, but Mary was still weeping at the tomb. Some people have noticed it's a little bit strange because Mary ran to get Peter and the beloved disciple, but it never says how she came back. But suddenly she's just, there at the tomb so that's kind of funny some some people think that suggests sort of like a redactional editing of the text because like there's something strange about mary leaving the scene and then suddenly being right back at the scene and not narrating how she got back but she's crying and then these two angels appear to her in the tomb and they say why are you weeping and she says they've taken away my lord and then there's um, a man who appears and she thinks he's the gardener and he says, woman, why are you weeping? And she says, if you, she thinks he's the gardener. She said, sir, if you've taken him away, tell me and let me know and I'll take his body away, which is kind of an intense thing to say. And then he says, Mary. And she recognizes him as Jesus. And she says, Raboni. And that word, um, in your Bible, it will say that the word means teacher, but some ancient manuscripts translate that word as Lord. So depending upon the manuscript you're looking at, the word Raboni could mean teacher or Lord. Some manuscripts actually say teacher and Lord. Um, and then she suddenly recognizes him. And then some manuscripts, see, this is fun because I can tell you all the manuscript variations. That's not always talked about. 
some manuscripts then have an extra piece where Mary Magdalene runs to touch Jesus. And that's in a lot of manuscripts, actually. And um, then Jesus says, do not cling to me. He says, me mu haptu in the Greek, which basically says, don't keep touching me. So it's kind of funny, like, was she actually touching him? It's hard to know. But he says, don't keep clinging to me, but go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my God and your God, to my father and your father, my God and your God. And so Mary Magdalene understands what Jesus says to her. She goes to the other disciples. He said, go to my brothers. But what she ends up doing is going to the other disciples. And she says, I have seen the Lord. And again, <laughs> see, I, I'm a textual critic, so I know all the different manuscripts, like ancient manuscripts, fourth century manuscripts say different things. And there's, this is also a really interesting scene where in John 20, verse 18, some manuscripts say what Jesus said to her, she revealed to them. So that's like a variation on the story that some ancient manuscripts have. And I've theorized um, in a publication that just came out that maybe whoever wrote the Gospel of Mary had access to that version of John, where Mary Magdalene isn't just saying, I saw the Lord. And she just tells the other people. And then after that, like Jesus appears to Thomas and stuff. That's afterward. But I'm my theory is that since some ancient copies said the things that Jesus said to her, she revealed to them, that slightly different wording in Greek, it's menuo. It means to reveal. Um, it's possible that um, whoever wrote the Gospel of Mary was inspired by this description of Jesus sending her to the disciples and her revealing some knowledge that he gave to her. And that could have been the basis and the inspiration for the Gospel of Mary. That's just a thought. Um, it, you know, the Gospel of Mary could have been composed for multiple reasons, but it does seem that this idea of Mary Magdalene as a sort of revealer of Jesus's teachings is an important sort of minority version of John 20, verse 18. If anybody is doubting me, um, like you can look at the Syriac Sinaitic Palimpsest. Um, it's a fourth century copy of the Gospels, and it's been translated by Agnes Smith Lewis. If you go to John 20, 18, it says very clearly that Mary Magdalene revealed to the other disciples. So different manuscripts say different things. That's why being a textual critic is fun. <laughs> so does this indicate that the um does this indicate that the gospel of john has gone through multiple stages of editing uh throughout the centuries but the uh, people with the different scribes with different views are making the gospel of john say different things nobody would doubt that that's common knowledge um if you have a decent bible and you open it up to John chapter eight, actually John seven, verse 53 to eight, 11. Hopefully you have a decent Bible that has that section in brackets. That's the story of the woman caught in adultery. And it's not in any of the oldest copies of the gospel of John. It starts to show up in fifth century copies. And of course, everybody loves that story. Like let he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's a wonderful story. And many people think that it is the historical Jesus who um, like that is a real story that really happened, but it it does it wasn't written by the author of John. It might have been sort of a floating story. In fact, some manuscripts it shows up at the end of the Gospel of John after John twenty one. You just get the story of the woman caught in adultery just as, sort of as an add on at the end. Some copies, and these are like tenth eleventh century copies. The story of the woman caught in adultery shows up in the Gospel of Luke. So that's a really like everybody agrees that that's something that kind of got added later to the Gospel of John. So yes, that that definitely was inserted later. There's other parts, like there's the scene with the angel at the pool in John chapter five. I think it's John five three b to four that says that um, that there was like a spirit that moved on the water um, that like helped with the assistance of healing people, and that one also shows up only in manuscripts you know, basically after the fifth century. But I mean, there's there's definitely editing that's going on in the text. It's the job of textual critics to try to get as far back as possible. And the two that I've told you about, the story of the woman caught in adultery and the one of the angel at the pool who moves the water, um, those are not in the oldest copies of the Gospel of John. Copies like Papyrus 66, Papyrus 75, Papyrus 45, 
um, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus. Those are the oldest, like substantial copies of John's Gospel, and they don't have those scenes in them. So yeah, those ones would have been added later. Um, and then my my theory about Martha um, being added that would be um, that would have been done very very early. That would have had to have been done probably in the second century if there was an editorial edition of Martha. And we don't have any copies that we know of where, um, unless somebody's hiding it in the basement of the Vatican or something, we don't actually have any copies like that um, where Martha's totally absent. There's just a lot of instability. If you look at a couple hundred transcriptions of John simultaneously, which I do, which I have done in multiple languages, not just Greek, the language of composition, but Latin, Coptic, uh, Ge'ez, which is Ethiopic, Syriac. You can see that there is, wherever Martha appears, there's sort of instability and inconsistency in how she's presented. Like sometimes Mary's serving the supper in John chapter 12, or some church fathers say that Mary said the tomb stank when your Bible would say that Martha said the tomb stank and that Martha served the supper. So I've just sort of theorized, okay, maybe Martha was editorially added to John, but that one is just a theory. Um, it can't be proven. The other ones, uh, as, far as, as far as the story of the woman caught in adultery and the angel at the pool, those are really well known, basically provable that they were not written by the evangelist because we have copies, circulating copies, where those are just not there. So yes, people were adding to the text of John and there's textual variants, um, sometimes as far back as you, as you can go, like in the Last Supper scene, the oldest copy that we have, Papyrus 66, um, there's like two different versions of who speaks first. When Jesus says, someone's going to betray me, um, some copies say that Simon says to the beloved disciple, Simon Peter says, tell who it is. That's t Peter talking first. But then some copies say, that the beloved disciple says to, to Jesus, say, like, who is it, Lord, right? And so this discrepancy is actually, if you look in Papyrus 66, you see both versions described. Sorry, I, I think my Wi-Fi dropped for a second. I hope you can still see me. Yeah. It Excited talking about textual variants. That's what happens. Sometimes. I'll re repeat what you were saying in the last 10 seconds. Oh, I was just saying that in, like, even in Papyrus 66, the oldest copy, the scribe writes one version of who speaks first at the Last Supper and erases it and replaces it with the other one. And if you look at the oldest copies, like half of them say that Simon Peter spoke first and half of them say that the beloved disciple spoke first. So shrug, like, we don't actually know whether Simon Peter or the beloved disciple spoke first in that moment. So yes, as far back as we can go, we can see that um, there are editorial decisions being made. Um, it's not necessarily scribes that are making the decisions. It's possible that um, there's an editor, like a scribe is like just doing a diligent copy. And then there's someone who's sort of overseeing the work. And it might be that an editor is saying, oh, you know, I don't like a copy where the beloved disciple speaks before Simon. You know, we like Simon Peter better. Can like let's let's make a version where Simon Peter speaks first. And it might not be the scribe at all. It might be somebody else, or it might be even a reader, like someone who owns a copy of John's Gospel just for their personal use. Or and maybe they like said something about the angel in the pool in the margin, and they wrote it in the margin, and then somebody borrowed their copy, and they're like, oh look, uh, looks like. That's supposed to be in there. And then they just put it in the body of the text. And then suddenly it becomes, because, you know, there's no printing press back then. Everything's being copied by hand. People could make mistakes. People could make readers' notes. Editors might say, might make changes. And yes, there is a lot of textual instability at the origins of the New Testament transmission. It is the job of textual critics to do our very best to recover based on various arguments and these days various algorithms that, that show how all of these manuscripts are related to one another. And you can usually get a pretty good sense of what the evangelist wrote, but there are dozens, if not hundreds of spots where we're not totally certain what the evangelist wrote. And this is not just in John's gospel, it's in all of the gospels.
Felix Magnus asks, added for what purpose? Well, there's lots of different reasons why someone might add something like the story of the woman caught in adultery. Um, some people have theorized that this actually came from a book called the Gospel of the Hebrews, um, which we know existed. St. Jerome references it. Origen references it. Origen's third century. Jerome is fifth century. So it's a book that was circulating, but it wasn't included in the canon. It wasn't considered like totally legit. But maybe there's a really awesome story from the Gospel of Hebrews. The story of the woman caught in adultery is people really like it. It's really powerful. We don't like the Gospel of the Hebrews, but we like this story and we're going to try to preserve it. So they might like just slip it into a place where Jesus is talking in the temple because um, the story of the woman caught in adultery takes place in the temple. So, um, hey, here's a context in John's Gospel where you can slip in this story and then we can preserve this wonderful story about Jesus in the canonical Gospels if we add it to John. So that's one example of one purpose. Um, somebody might, uh, I've said that maybe Martha was added to the gospel of John because Mary Magdalene was a controversial figure. And some people thought that Mary of Bethany was Mary Magdalene. They did. We know that. And, um, if she's the one who says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, the one coming into the world, John 11, verse 27. Um, that's the thesis statement of the gospel of John. Um, if, if it turns out that Mary Magdalene says that, and then she's the first person to get an appearance of the risen Jesus in John 20, the scene with the gardener that I told you about earlier, that would make her a really prominent disciple, um, prominent follower of Jesus that might have been too threatening um, for a woman to have that much authority. So you could take this character, Martha from Luke's gospel and stick her into John's gospel um, to make sure that Mary Magdalene is sort of diluted in John. So now you've get you get Mary and Martha from Luke's gospel and then Mary Magdalene at the cross and the empty tomb. So again, that's theoretical. That would be a more like hey, this gospel is too giving too much prominence to this one woman and it's a way of sort of diminishing authority. Again, just theoretical. That is another possible purpose of a change made to the text. Um, the thing about Peter and the beloved disciple in uh, John chapter 13, um, maybe somebody who really liked Peter didn't like that the beloved disciple was speaking first because that had to do with like rank and hierarchy. If you look at some Dead Sea Scrolls documents, it talks about when you're at the supper and the person who has the higher rank gets to speak first. If someone thinks that Peter has a higher rank than the beloved disciple, they might want to tweak the text a little bit so that Peter is speaking before the beloved disciple does. These are various. So some of them are more banal. Some of them are also mistakes. Like, you know, a scribe might accidentally misread a word or, you know, there's plenty of mistakes also, because again, it's all copied by hand. And some of them might be because the scribe disagreed or Maybe the scribe didn't do it. Maybe it was an editor or a reader or the scribe tried to clarify something or an editor tried to clarify something. These are human beings and they left their mark on the text. And it's the job of textual critics to really understand early Christianity very, very well to try to theorize what the motives might be or what the reasons might be for these textual changes. I've got a couple of super chat questions. We'll start with JM. Thank you for your thumbs up and super chat. John D, thank you for your super chat. Do you have a pet theory for why the MM was, it was important in the early movement? Mary Magdalene was important in the early movement. I've seen as uh, I've even in, assuming she was at the empty tomb. Why was she there? Rich patron? Well, I mean, for why she was important. I mean, the way that, like, why was Peter important? <laughs> you know, there just seemed to be certain followers of Jesus that had more prominence than others. And um, for whatever reason, Mary Magdalene seems to have been the one that was the most important um, in the list. She's usually listed first. I, I mean, who knows? I mean, why, why were Andrew and... Peter and the sons of Zebedee, the most important. I don't know. They were fishermen. Jesus chose them. Maybe 
you know, in the Gospel of Luke, it says that Jesus healed Mary Magdalene of seven demons. Um, so maybe, you know, and, and if she was wealthy, maybe she was very grateful and she wanted to support his ministry because he made such a difference for her life. But again, like that's oh, also some people would say you can historically know that Mary Magdalene had demons, but you can't really know that because only one evangelist says that. There's also the ending of Mark, a long ending that was added later. Again, there's other textual variants in other gospels. And the long ending of Mark is almost certainly based on Luke's description of Mary Magdalene. The long ending of Mark says that Mary Magdalene was healed of seven demons also. But that doesn't mean you can historically say that Mary Magdalene was healed of seven demons. But Luke seems to think that she was. And his reasons for doing so, maybe he heard that or maybe he didn't like Mary Magdalene and he wanted to say something mean about her. Or maybe she really was. I mean, who knows? Um, or maybe it was a rumor. I mean, different traditions, different things that people heard. The Gospels differ in their presentations of these various characters. Um, so, I mean, Matthew, Mark, and John portray Mary Magdalene 100% positively. It's only Luke that says that um, she had these seven demons. And Luke is a little bit tricky because Luke almost certainly had access to Mark's Gospel which says that Mary Magdalene and um, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome were at the cross. And Luke omits that detail. Luke will not tell you the women's names at the cross. And then also Luke does not say that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. He says she went to the tomb, she saw some angels and she went to the men. But it doesn't actually, Luke doesn't actually say that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. So some people have theorized that Luke doesn't really like Mary Magdalene. Luke is a very women-friendly gospel, but he doesn't seem to particularly like Mary Magdalene. So it's hard to say that what Luke says about Mary Magdalene is historically accurate, um, or any of them, honestly. But um, Luke seems to have a particular issue with hers that some people have noticed. Um, but why she was important, if Luke is historically accurate in describing her as being healed from seven demons, and that she had the money to finance Jesus's ministry. Maybe she was just really grateful. And um, why was she at the empty tomb? Well, the gospels do say that the women who were close to Jesus are trying to take care of his body, to care for his body, um, especially Mark and Matthew do say that, you know, they're getting spices and they want to um, anoint the body and to care for, and the Gospel of Peter says that too, actually. That's another apocryphal text that mentions Mary Magdalene and puts her first in the list. It says that they're trying to care for the, it says she's caring for her beloved dead. So if you have spices and the body was just kind of thrown in a tomb and it hasn't been cared for, the, the closest people will come and take care of the body and prepare it to be sealed in the tomb um, at that time, bodies were steal sealed in the tomb and kind of like anointed with spices. And then they would decompose over time. And then all that would be left were the bones. And several years later, the family members would return and take the bones and put them in an ossuary. And it's like a little box that the bones would be kept in. So that's why, um, that's probably why, at least according certainly to Mark's gospel, that's why the women went to the tomb was to care for his body to prepare it so that it could decompose and eventually the, the bones would be there so that eventually it could be put in an ossuary. But they went there and supposedly the tomb was empty. I hope that answers your question. That's a lot of info I just dropped there. <laughs> JC, thank you for your super chat. Did the name Magdala refer to tower or flower? Tower. Um, Gadal in... Uh, Hebrew means to make great. And the M in Hebrew, um, or Gadal is, in Hebrew is to make great. And the preformative, the Mem, but at the beginning, makes something into a noun. So it's Migdal, Gadal. It's just sort of consonants in Hebrew. It's Migdal in Hebrew. And then in Aramaic, it's Magdala, but it's the same consonants, G, D, L. And the mem, the m at the beginning makes it into a noun. So it's like noun makes something great. So you could also, it could technically also mean magnification. That's what origin of Alexandria says that her name means magnification. But also if you look at, you know, 
maps of ancient Palestine, there were several towns called Magdala Nunaya, or sort of Migdal Nunaya, Migdal Gad, Migdal El. It's all Tower of the Fish, Tower of God, Tower of this or that. So it, it definitely means tower. JC, thanks again. Another super chat. RV Doves and Fish of Artagartus, Jonah's sign. I I don't know what Utter Goddess is. I'm sorry. Um, I'm more of a New Testament scholar, so right. stuff to do with Jonah isn't really my wheelhouse. Sorry. Yeah. And that one was off topic for sure. Um, uh, do you know what Utter Goddess is? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a deity. Uh, I think it was an ancient Greek deity. Yeah, not my, not my wheelhouse. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry yeah, it's that. a Greek deity, <laughs> chief goddess of northern Syria. All right, yeah. good to know. Jimmy Mac, thank you, thank you for your question. Is there any evidence that the word prologue in John 1, 1 to 14 existed outside of the gospel as a hymn or creedal statement, rather than being an original work of the author of John? That's a good question. So um, in the 1980s and the 1990s, there was a really popular trend in biblical studies called source criticism, where oftentimes, um, this is different than textual criticism. I'm a textual critic, where you look at different manuscripts, actual copies of the Gospels, and you compare them with one another and see what the differences are between them. So you're looking at manuscripts. But source critics will look at just sort of like a usual Greek text of John as it's been critically edited. And they would notice stylistic differences or discrepancies in sort of the final, quote unquote, final version of John, though there hasn't ever really been a full version of John, as I was sort of telling you, it sort of changed over the centuries. But um, when they look at the prologue of John, it's got a slightly different style. It's sort of got a hymnic feel. It's got sort of a beautiful rhythm to it. And sort of like the Philippians hymn in, in Paul, there's, it seems to be, just since it has sort of a different cadence, it looks just stylistically different. And so source critics, people who theorize that the evangelists had, or Paul had sources that they had access to, previous sources, they would say that this is sort of this prologue of John is something that people were saying about Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? So um, because it has such a different style to it, People would think that that's something that was maybe said in certain early Christian communities and that beautiful hymnic quality was put at the opening of John. And then the evangelist John starts to tell the history of Jesus after that prologue. Now, every single copy of the Gospel of John, remember I told you I work in manuscripts. Every manuscript of John begins with the prologue and it's not like there's any um, discrepancy. There's there, I mean, there are little textual variants but there's, there's no major changes between the prologue and the sort of narrative section that starts talking about John the Baptist later in John 1. So there's no way to prove that the evangelist did or did not write that prologue. It's mainly just that since it's stylistically different than the rest of the gospel, people think that maybe it was inherited by the evangelist or that it was the hymn used in the evangelist's community. But these are just sort of, um, again, this is source criticism, where you're looking at the final, quote unquote, text of the gospel and noticing characteristics of it and trying to discern like what the different styles might mean. And that's sort of the theory that scholars have come to, that maybe it was a, a hymn that the evangelist inherited. But again, can't prove it. JC, thank you for your super chat, but please. It's stick in to Hebrew. It's in Hebrew. I sorry, I don't read Hebrew. Certainly not right off the screen. <laughs> Maybe I could do Greek, but it'd be pretty slow. <laughs> Let's take this question, Brett Forsa. Thank you for your question. Who do you suspect the beloved disciple is? That's a great question. Um. There's different theories on this one. And um, obviously, for the most most of church history, there was 
a theory that, um, or it was assumed that the beloved disciple was John, John of Zebedee. That's sort of what Irenaeus of Lyon put forward um, in his book Against Heresies at the end of the second century. And sort of ever since then, people have said, yeah, John is the beloved disciple. But then sort of at the end of the 19th century, some people started to challenge this, noticing that um, there's a lot of things in the way that John is described in the synoptic gospels that don't match up with the way that the beloved disciple is described. Um, the beloved disciple in John seems to be uh, from Judea, whereas uh, in um, the synoptic, we find out that John of Zebedee is from Galilee. So that doesn't really work. Also, the book of Acts says that John of Zebedee and Peter are unlettered. They have no education. But whoever wrote the Gospel of John seems to have had some training in rhetoric and familiarity with um, platonic ideas. And that's probably not something that like an uneducated fisherman would have had access to. They wouldn't have been able to write beautiful rhetoric in Greek. Um, and also other small details like um, supposedly uh, if like, why isn't the transfiguration ever mentioned in the gospel of John? Because that's like one of John of Zebedee's biggest moments is when a Jesus, the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah appear next to Jesus in the synoptic gospels, um, James and John and Peter are there to witness it. So why is that not talked about in the gospel of John if John is the beloved disciple? So because of these um, reasons, at the end of the 19th century, some German scholars started to challenge it. And um, then, then the sort of floodgate started to open and people started to have theories. If it's not John of Zebedee, who is it? And um, an, sort of a perennial popular idea is that it could be Lazarus because in the story of John 11, uh, it explicitly says that Jesus loved Lazarus. And um, there's also theories that it could be. It's a, James Charlesworth wrote a book that is not particularly popular, but it says that Thomas is the beloved disciple. Um, I think James Tabor made the argument that uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is the beloved disciple. Some people have said that John Mark is the beloved disciple. Sandra Schneiders and Esther DeBoer have argued that Mary Magdalene is the beloved disciple. It's a little tricky, though, because of that scene that I mentioned where Mary Magdalene runs to Peter and the beloved disciple in John chapter 20. Mary Magdalene is different, definitely a different person than the beloved disciple described in John chapter 20. So that's that's tricky. Um, but you could argue that Mary Magdalene is the beloved disciple at the cross. Um, that's what Sandra Schneiders argues. And I think she does a pretty good job because uh, at John 19, it says, standing at the foot of the cross were Jesus's mother, his mother's sister, Mary of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Therefore, Jesus seeing his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. Wait a second. Like there's just a list of women. So if it says, so, so you could argue from that, that in at the cross that Mary Magdalene is the beloved disciple in that particular scene, then Jesus says, woman, behold your son. And so some people have said, Oh, well, it can't be Mary Magdalene because, um, this, it, Jesus is referencing a male person. But then Esther de Boer pointed out, what if Jesus is saying, woman, behold your son, as in, look at me, your son, Jesus. He's saying, mom, look at me. And if you look at it that way, <clears throat> you could interpret John 11, 50, sorry, 11, 19, 25 to 27 as saying that Mary Magdalene is the beloved disciple in that particular scene. Um, it, 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 again, is still tricky though, because it uses masculine grammar. It says ha mathetes. Ha is the masculine nominative article. The disciple. The word the is masculine. The disciple whom Jesus loved. So, I mean, some people would say, oh, the word mathetes itself is kind of a weird word. It has a feminine ending on it, but that's, even though it's a masculine word. I mean, it's, the, the thing is like you could, you can sort of make the argument in John 19 for Mary Magdalene, but it doesn't work in John chapter 20 because she runs to the beloved disciple. Um, so what I'm interested in though, I am really interested in how texts like the gospel of Philip and the gospel of Mary say that Jesus loved her more than everybody else. 
And they both, both the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip do seem to have some familiarity with the Gospel of John. So I'm curious if, for whatever reason, those communities, maybe because of that scene in John 19 that I just told you about, for whatever reason, the communities that wrote the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Philip might have thought, that she was the beloved disciple, and then maybe they just ignored that scene where she runs to the beloved disciple in John chapter 20, because it doesn't really work with what the evangelist wrote. But you could still be in a community that says, you know, whatever, we want her to be the beloved disciple. And so the Gospel of Mary, so it says in the Gospel of Mary that Jesus loves her more than the others, as and it also says that in the Gospel of Philip. So you, some early Christian communities might have thought that, but then you also have to take into account that texts like the Book of Thomas the Contender and um, the Gospel of, well, the Gospel of Thomas seems to think that James is the most beloved. The Book of Thomas the Contender says that Thomas is the most beloved. So there's all these early Christian communities that are competing with one another for identifying who the most beloved disciple is. And of course, some say that it's John. Irenaeus says that it's John, and also the Acts of John says that it's John. These are all like kind of second century competing groups, and they all have their own opinion of who the beloved disciple is. I think it's really difficult to know what the evangelist thought, but you can get to early Christian communities, and I think it's possible that some early Christian communities thought that Mary Magdalene was the or a beloved disciple, but that doesn't mean she was historically so. There's just as many who thought that Thomas was, or that James was, or that John was. I hope that answers your question. Another super chat question from JC again. Thank you for, thank you for your super chat. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet smelling mirror. Are, okay. is, I think um, JC is trying to find the verses from Song of Songs. Was it, sorry, was it, did I say chapter four? Maybe it's chapter three of the Song of Songs. It's when she runs from her bed at night and she she runs into the the watcher, sorry, the, the guards. And she says to them, have you seen my beloved? Is it John, is it Song of Songs chapter three? I think... So I, I think you're probably looking in the Song of Songs and trying to find what I was referencing. Um, it's the one where Mary Magdalene, uh, sorry, where the, the Shulamite bride is running through the streets and she's seeking her beloved. And then um, it says that she finds her beloved and she will not let him go. And um, ever since the very beginnings of Christian interpretation, I th sorry, I think it's Song of Songs chapter three. Ever since the very beginnings of Christian interpretation. Song of Solomon 5.13. Oh, it's five. Sorry, I should know which chapter. Sorry. Wait, is that, is this, you're saying that the one he just gave is chapter five? Yeah, it's in chapter five. Okay, look at chapter three. I think it's chapter three. Um, ever since the beginning of Christian interpretation, as, and also modern interpreters see that the Song of Song, some people call it Song of Songs, some people call it the Song of Solomon, but it's the exact same book. Um, there is sort of an intertext that sort of John is subtly referencing this scene in the Song of Songs or Solomon when the Shulamite bride is running through the streets at night seeking her beloved. John chapter 20 seems to have been sort of written with that in mind. There's a question from earlier I'm trying to find. Uh, here it is. Theophilus09, thank you for your question. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with the God. The Logos was a God. No definite mm -hmm. article in early Greek manuscripts. That's right. <clears throat> and um, I was, I've been interested in that exact question, and I it took me some time in Greek classes to find out the answer to this. Um, the absence of the article helps you. It actually is what causes the translations to say, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It actually technically says, if you look in the Greek, it looks like it's saying God was the word, but it's because of the absence of the definite article that it's translated as the word was God. It's a Greek stylistic device. Um, that's why the article is absent. It's, it's not saying... Um, 
the word was a God. It's saying the word was God. Um, it has to do with like, it's, it's a stylistic thing that affects the translation. Um, and only like super Greek experts know that kind of thing. I'm not a translator. I do read ancient Greek, but this is sort of a technicality. It took me a while to figure out what was going on there. And it's a stylistic choice to remove the definite article there. And if there's no definite article, yes, it's it's more likely to be a god than the god, but it's 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 more like the stylistically the absence of the article indicates that you should translate it as the word was God. I hope that's clear. It's it's something for like super Greek nerds, which I am not one of, but that's that's what the the absence of the article means there. That's a detailed question. I'm glad I knew the answer because that's something that's very niche. <laughs> well, he's got another one right here. The noun mathetas is grammatically masculine, and it would have been odd to refer to Miriam Hegadolo at the foot of the cross. It's not Hegadola. It's Migadella. Migadella. Mm. But yes, mathetes, the... the re it is a masculine word, ha mathetes, but the ending of it, the declension of it, eta sigma, is usually reserved for feminine nouns. So it's sort of an interesting, the word mathetes in itself, I think it's their declension. It's just one of these kind of like strange nouns that even though it's masculine, it has feminine endings on it. But I mean, that doesn't necessarily, there's other words like that. Mathetes is sort of unique in that way, but it's not the only um, masculine noun that has sort of traditionally feminine endings. It's usually the feminine endings have eta vowels, um, but it's it's not totally unique in that way. Sandra Schneider's in her article about it seem to suggest that the word sort of has a feminine resonance to it, but you could definitely debate Sandra Schneider's on that one. Um, it definitely says, Ha mathetes, which is a masculine word. There is a word for a female disciple that's mathetris. And in the Gospel of Peter, Mary Magdalene is uh, identified as a mathetris. So the masculine word for disciple is used in the Gospel of John. I wouldn't say like grammatically masculine. I mean, it is a masculine noun, but the ending is sort of a feminine. It's a more traditional to have eta sigma in feminine words than masculine words. Dorky Greek stuff. JC, thank you for your super chat. But um, you know, you're saying Mag Magdalot equals flowers. We yeah, talked about that's, this earlier. The thing is, is that you can have fun like looking at modern Greek words and playing. There's actually a guy named James David Odlin who's like, said, here's like a hundred different possibilities for what the word mandolin means. And you can look up his work, but that's not actually grounded in the history. You have to look at what people in antiquity were saying about her name. And everybody in antiquity agreed that it had to do with this word referencing a tower or magnification. Origen says magnification. Although there are some rabbis who say that Megadella is referencing her being a hairdresser. And that has to do with like piling hair up. It's But everyone agrees that it's the the root verb is the consonants G, D, L, gadal. And that means to make great. And then the preformative mem turns it into a noun. So it's, a, it's, it's about making great. Even if you're talking about making hair great, <laughs> or if it's a tower great or making a woman great, they're all rooted. It's not about flowers. It's about building up in some way. Um, and so, yeah, you can't just look at like a modern lexicon. That doesn't actually work. You have to see what ancient people, third, fourth, fifth century were saying about her name. And they were all agreed that it had to do with this uh, root gadal to make great. JC again, thank you for your super chat. If in some instance it means flowers as in songs five, it can connote flower. Hmm. That's an interesting. So you're saying that the word Magdala is in Song of Songs five in the verse that you just sent? 
I'm not sure if he's trying to say that. Is that what he's saying? Can you said so? Is it um, five verse? Was it verse one or what? Five? What verse did you say it was, Jacob? I think it was verse three. Yeah, five, I'm sorry, five. verse fifth, verse thirteen. Excuse me. Oh, sorry, five verse 13. thirteen. I will look that up. Um, in the Hebrew, I'm not as uh good <laughs> in Hebrew as I am in Greek. But the I can look that up. But um, I'm seeing it right here. The Hebrew word megdalot is is translated as towers. It's it says towers in five verse three. But five verse thirteen. Oh, five verse thirteen. Sorry. So it's it it mm -hmm. is tower, not flower in five thirteen. I mean, you have to look at all the consonants. To be. You have to look at all the consonants in the Hebrew. Um, like you can't just like skip a consonant or add a consonant. Yeah. But I. I can look it up. Pretty sure it's about a tower. Pretty sure. But I will look that up in 513 and double check. So my closing question. Are the Gospels, are they pretty consistent in how they describe Mary Magdalene? Or even when they fill out, even, even when, when one Gospel fills in the blanks, it doesn't necessarily contradict the information provided about her from the prior Gospel. Do they contradict one another? That's a good question. No, they do contradict one another in the empty tomb scenes. I would say they don't contradict each other as for her being at the cross. They all, Matthew, Mark, and John all explicitly say that Mary Magdalene is at the cross. Luke withholds the women's names, which is a little bit fishy because he, he knows Mark. So why is he withholding that piece of information that Mark provides? Um, and Luke adds this extra piece that she was healed from seven demons. And um, so, like, I guess that that doesn't directly contradict the other Gospels. But they do contradict one another in the empty tomb scenes. They all have a different story. John says that Mary Magdalene went by herself to the tomb and ran to get Peter and the beloved disciple. That's one Gospel. Mark says that Mary Magdalene and Mary of Joseph saw where Jesus's body was laid. And then the next day, Mary Magdalene, Mary of James and Salome came and with, and brought spices. So, and by the way, different copies of Mark say different things. I also wrote an article about that, that sometimes it's just Mary Magdalene and Mary of James that go to the empty tomb. So Salome is actually not there in some of the oldest copies of Mark's gospel. Um, so that's always kind of weird to me. Like if the three oldest copies say three different things as to the women who went to the empty tomb in Mark, that's like something sketchy is happening there. Um, so even different copies of Mark disagree with one another as to who accompanied Mary Magdalene at the entombment and the empty tomb. Then Matthew says that it was just Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And um, Mark does not have Jesus appear to them. They just run away afraid. In Matthew, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary get an appearance of the risen Jesus. He does appear to them and they get to worship him and touch his feet. In John, it's just Mary Magdalene by herself, but she doesn't get to touch Jesus. So that's definitely different than Matthew. And a lot of ancient people had problems with that. They're like, did she touch him or not? And um, then Luke, Mary Magdalene goes with Mary of James and is it Joanna? Yet, it, you know, totally different woman. Um, but it's, it actually doesn't name the women at all. It just says that some women saw him crucified. Some women went to the tomb. Then they ran and they told the men. And this is who it was. So the people who accompany Mary Magdalene differ. And whether she actually gets the appearance of the risen Jesus differs. And whether she's alone differs and whether she gets to touch Jesus differs. So each gospel has a totally contradictory story to the others when it comes to the appearance of Jesus, the first appearance and who was with Mary Magdalene or if she was by herself. So yeah, that, that to me indicates that there's something controversial because not only do the gospels not agree with one another, sometimes even the copies of the same gospel don't agree with one another in the actual story that it tells. So 
I think that sort of helps indicate for me that Mary Magdalene was sort of controversial from the very beginning. But that's that's just one scholar's view. Teresa W, Teresa thank you for your secret job. Wished a woman of the Jesus movement could have written something that survived. Were wealthy women of first century educated to read and write? That's a great question. Um, yes, some women were educated to read and write. If you, um, I mean, like if you've heard of the poet Sappho, and that's before the first century, she's a very well known poet from um, an ancient Greek poet. And so she was obviously literate. Um, one of the most beautiful early Christian works is a diary by, in Latin, by a woman named Perpetua. If you look at the Passion of Perpetua and Felicity, it's from like 203 AD when these women were martyred. There is a wealthy woman named Vivia Perpetua who was educated and who probably had some training in rhetoric and her diary survives and she describes how she was imprisoned and it describes going up to when she was martyred and then someone else takes over the narration. Yes, there were some women who could write. Um, but yes, they would have had to be wealthy and um, it would have been a, a minority situation. Very few women were, but there's also some ancient letters that survive. Like for instance, Oxyrhynchus is sort of like an ancient trash heap that where they found hundreds of thousands of scraps of papyrus. And some of them are letters. Sometimes a woman signs her own name and every once in a while a woman does write some letters. Interestingly, the women's handwriting is sometimes not as good, maybe because the family didn't invest as much into her education. But yes, sometimes women could read. And also Jerome, his lady friends, this is in the fifth century, his lady friends like Paula, um, he he corresponded with them a great deal. And there was women like Melania the Elder, Melania the Younger, who read and read and read. And Mac Macrina, the, the sister of uh, Gregory of Nyssa, one of the, these are Cappadocians, some of the greatest thinkers of the fourth century. She was absolutely able to read. So yes, it was usually women from wealthy families. Um, but uh, in certain circumstances, yes, women could read and write. But I would say it's a very minority. All right, let's take this super chat as the last one and we'll close. Hey, Gray, thank you for your super chat. You mentioned James Audlin, who has been a guest on History Valley. What do you agree or disagree about his statements? James Audlin is a very creative scholar. He has, uh, and he is erudite in his familiarity with um, Syriac and Hebrew. Um, I think sometimes he gets into a little bit of trouble because he sort of operates on his own and um, he doesn't really, he doesn't participate in scholarship with other scholars, um, which means that he can sort of be in, in his own viewpoint and nobody, he doesn't really position himself in a way where anybody could sort of challenge or correct him. Um, and this gets sometimes into a little bit of trouble because he asserts his own very eclectic interpretation and he he's very specialized. So there aren't a lot of people that can like talk to him about Syriac or Aramaic. And he will make a statement that is really his own very niche perspective on it and state it as a fact. And he doesn't submit his work to peer review, which is one of the very most important things about scholarship. Um, not just to be taken seriously as a scholar, but to be a responsible scholar. You really need to put your work um, into conversation with other specialists. And um, almost every time the specialists will give you something that makes your work stronger and better. I'm saying this as someone who like, I'm submitting peer reviewed articles right now and I get all these comments back. I'm like, oh, what a pain in the butt. But guess what? Those comments are from real experts, real specialists, and they're giving you something to make your work stronger. And that's the kind of rigor that is necessary for a scholar to be not just taken seriously in the field, but to be responsible and ethical as a scholar. You need to listen to your peers. And unfortunately, James Allen does not participate in that. He just does his own thing. And so nobody challenges him 
and he doesn't submit his work to scrutiny. And so he kind of makes very bold statements. Um, I did actually at one point submit his work to scrutiny with another Syriac specialist. And they told me that what he was interpreting was um, really unlikely. <laughs> but he state, he was stating it to me as a fact. And I, I have to say that made me a bit cautious. If someone is asserting something as a fact when they haven't submitted it to anyone else's scrutiny, it's, um, I, I would say, always read peer-reviewed scholars. That's a good rule of thumb. Well, thank you for joining me today, Dr. Elizabeth Crater Bolster. Yeah, my pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for their questions and for their super chats. And I'll see all of you next time. Great to meet everybody. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.